Hello, my name is Bob Tribe and welcome to Valley to Vietnam. Valley to Vietnam is a joint effort between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Veterans of America Chapter 500. It is our intent to trace the arc of experience between Sacramento and Vietnam for our local Vietnam era vets. Today our guest is Jim McCooey, who was a first lieutenant with the 101st Airborne, yay, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and he served there in 1966 and 67. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Bob. Great to be here. Well, it's good to have you here. You uh, you grew up in Winters, which is about, what, 30, 35 miles west of here? Yes. It, uh, in fact, it used to be 28, and I guess it's Sacramento's expanded so much, oh. it's uh, now about 30 miles. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, um, growing up in Winters, that's pretty rural. That's a big farming community. Uh, what was that like? Well, I I would describe it as a um, kind of a Huckleberry Finn, Jack Armstrong, you <laughs> yeah. know, type of environment to grow up in. Sure. Um, a small community, a very um, generous and tight knit community, uh, where everybody looked out for each other yes. and um, nice. I could go through numerous examples uh, but it was a truly uh, you know a, a great place to grow up um, I lost my mother I was nine years old oh no my father um, you know, he was a uh, superintendent of streets and water for the city of Winters and so he had to keep all the you know, the sewers running and the water running and uh, the, the leaves out of the storm drains and right. all that other stuff. And uh, But after my mother passed, uh, again, the neighbors and the community were just absolutely wonderful as far as, you know, looking out for our right. basic needs. That's nice. And uh, so it was uh, a great place to grow up. Sure. And, um, you went to grammar school and high school there? Yes, I went uh, <coughs> first, uh, we didn't have a kindergarten when I started, okay. so I started in the first grade at uh -huh. Winters Elementary and graduated uh, uh, from Winters High School in 1959. Okay. And uh, the high school in those days was about 200 and some change. Right. And, uh, the, you know, the, the only, uh, change in, in population in winters and the schools was when they built the Monticello Dam and, and that started the you know the construction started about 1955 okay and between 1955 and 1960 that was a big project probably brought in a lot of folks it brought in a lot of people and um, a lot of great people and a lot of jobs and sure some of them stayed yeah. You know, they they fell in love with the community and, and remained there as some of their contemporaries moved on to other projects. What well, well, what are the what were the primary crops in those days that they were growing around winters? Well, the primary crop in those days were apricots. Oh, okay. uh, the apricot orchards on the west side of the community and the, and that went up into Puta Canyon uh -huh. uh, were considered the earliest in. California. Okay. And um, in fact, our school schedules were uh, set around um, around the apricot crop. We, we'd get out a little earlier, and of course, we would start earlier. But yeah. uh, we would get out to help with uh, the harvest and uh, and whatnot. And, and you started doing that in grammar school, really? Oh, didn't you work in the fields? And absolutely. You yeah. know, we uh, you know we all had plenty of uh, things to do. You know. Yeah. Uh, all the way from you know picking up black walnuts, putting them in sacks, and right to uh, crawling around the ground picking up figs and picking up prunes, uh, and then working in the apricot cutting sheds uh -huh. where a lot of the growers w also would do drying. Okay, and so you know they had sheds, and you'd cut the apricot in half and place it on a tray, and then the tray would go out in, in the sun after it went through a sulfur house. It had a little sulfur treatment. Oh, and, and the purpose of that was what? Well, that was to uh, eliminate any uh, insects and, okay. you know, uh, 
anything that uh, would be considered a, a pest or anything. You know, and it's on, okay on for humans food. to eat sulfur. Oh, absolutely. Well, it, it, that's a debatable <laughs> topic. I, I personally, <laughs> if, if sulfur was bad for you, I'd have been dead a long time ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> and then there were, uh, for the apricot season, there were packing houses where fresh uh, apricots were packed into cartons, put uh -huh. in railroad cars, right. iced, and sent east. Okay. And, um, and that was a, a short season, you know, perhaps two to three weeks. And then the apricot thing moved from Winters to Brentwood. Oh, down, down the I know river. Brentwood, sure. Yeah, By down. Antioch. Yes, yeah. yeah. Now, um, and there were a, uh, some of the main employers at that time in Sacramento were all these big canneries, Del Monte and Libby's and Burkett Rich Richards. And yeah, that's correct. And, and they handled the processed uh, uh, end of the crops. Okay. Which, uh, you know, when the fresh thing would tail off, uh, and some of the later varieties would end up going to the canneries. Uh -huh. And then the canneries had receiving stations in winters where, you know, the farmer could load his boxes onto right. a bobtail truck and haul them to a receiving station and the canneries would have them on, you know, trucks, big trucks, and haul them to the canneries in uh, Sacramento or uh, San Jose area was and, full of them. And all these big canneries are in Sacramento are gone now. They're really? gone now. Yeah. Yes. One of my old uh, gymnasiums is, is at the Libby's, uh, old Libby's factory, you know, and so did that just move, uh, that, that all moved to other cities? And well, you know, you take the Libby uh, 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 cannery in Sacramento was primarily a, uh, a tomato cannery. Okay. And in, in those days, the tomatoes were packed into what they call whole pack tomatoes, where the, where the whole tomato was actually, you know, put in a can and then in sauces and ketchup and all, and sure. paste, all this stuff. And then the uh, tomato uh, processing industry changed greatly, and I would venture to say it was probably in the 80s uh -huh. and more so in the 90s where the tomato uh, canneries strictly went to paste operations uh -huh. where they would take the tomatoes and run them through a series of you know, filters and whatnot and put them in a concentrator and concentrate them into paste. The paste could be put into 55-gallon drums or into rail cars, and then from the paste they would, uh, you know, go ahead and make sauce and other tomato products. So there were other locations that were better equipped to do that pasting. Is that why they kind of left Sacramento then? Well, yes, and and the paste. If you look, <coughs> if you drive up I-5 north of Woodland, sure. between. Uh, Woodland and say Orland, uh -huh. you'll see a number of paste plants along oh. I-5 okay. on the east that's, side. That's uh, what those are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, and, and they're smaller. Uh, they're they're not labor intensive. Uh huh. And highly highly mechanized. You well, know. You, you're the person to talk about this because later we'll talk about how this was your occupation for oh. many years <laughs> yeah. in this industry. You had reason to come to Sacramento on a regular basis for kind of entertainment and such. What what sort of places did you go to? Well, yes, uh, Winters uh, w was a wonderful little community. However, they closed <laughs> the theater when I was about ten years old. Right. And so, as a teenager, uh, you know, we would we would come to Sacramento and we had Tower Records and. Um, the Alhambra Theater. And the Tower Theater. Uh, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah, the Tower Theater. Right. And of course, and then Mel's Drive In and Shakey's Pizza. Oh, yeah. Cruising J and K. Sure. You know. The same sort of things I did. You yeah. betcha. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, have some real fond memories. And then as a child, uh, there was a radio in my bedroom, and my father would come in and sit on the side of my bed, and we'd listen to Solon games. Oh yeah, and Tony Kester on KFBK, right. old yeah. Edmonds Field where, y yes. where the Target is now at Broadway and and uh, what's what's the there? Um, shoot, well uh, yeah, on Rod a, Broadway uh, by on, the old on, cemetery, on Broadway yeah. there. Yes, yeah, sure. and so um, that was before we had Major League Baseball in California. That's before uh -huh. the Giants and the Dodgers, sure. uh, you know, came to the yeah. West Coast. So. Uh, the Solons were our big league, you know, the Pacific Coast League. Yeah, it's triple, triple A, triple good a. baseball, really good yeah. baseball. And as a child, and I'm guessing between 10 and 12 years old, um, 
I would come over, there was a coach in, in winters and teacher who would bring me to the Sacramento baseball school and uh, in the morning and oh gosh and I, I was a I was a young pitcher and I had like people like Orville Grove, Lefty Grove oh, was sure. teaching the yeah. the uh, the pitchers and, and and that was quite an experience and then in the afternoon I would uh, I would uh, go with the coach out to William Land Park and I'd caddy for him. He, oh, uh, that yeah. was the payoff for the taking course. me to the baseball school oh, nice. was I'd caddy yeah. you know, uh, golf for him in, in the afternoon and that was a, an, an indelible experience you know, for me. And uh, So you're a big but, baseball player and fan and all that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, and I played, uh, I played baseball. Uh, I was, uh, you know, how times were different. Uh, this same person he, he started the Little League in winters, uh -huh. and uh, it was like 8 to 12, and I was 8, and I didn't make the cut as an 8-year-old <laughs> on yeah. the first Little League team. I wouldn't think so. You know, uh, I made it the next year, yeah. but, uh, but, you know, so they let us fail. I mean, right. you know, and uh, it was an incentive to work a little harder, it's, you know. To it's a difference. <laughs> when I think about playing Little League and what I see today, you know, it's just a different sort of set of values. Yeah, but it's a whole different thing. But I have fond memories of, uh, of coming to Sacramento for primarily the entertainment value. Yeah. And uh, Oh, and I used to come to Sacramento State back in, oh, I'm, I'm say 58 to 60. Uh, by the time I'm ready to graduate from high school, I had some pretty, uh, uh, pretty good boxing teams at Sacramento oh. State. Uh -huh. <coughs> and I loved boxing. And so I saw a lot of matches. I grew up with my dad listening to the Friday Night Gillette fights, you know, on TV and sit with him and watch that. It was a big, big deal. And it seems like they just had a lot of great boxers, especially middleweights and welterweights in those days. And it was one of the, it was just a big, big event. And it's unfortunately has. It's all changed. Yeah, it's changed yeah. for the worse. Uh, well, back in those days, uh, to to back to box professionally, you had to have uh, uh, two to three hundred amateur fights. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, today <laughs> there's no such thing. There's I no know. there's no amateur programs. Yeah, and uh, you know, and like Sac State, the teams they had, I'm, I'll never forget. One of the guys was uh, was a fellow by the name of Jim Flood. Oh, and, and, I remember him. And I think he was a military fighter before he came to Sac State. Yeah. But, I mean, it had some really, in sure. he probably had a couple hundred fights before he even came yeah. to Sacramento State, but great memories. Upon graduating from high school, you go to Cal Poly. Yes. And Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and your major was? Was, uh, <coughs> was uh, food production management. Okay. And it was a brand new major. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, there were four of us. That, that, <laughs> that, that pioneered this uh, wow. this major in 1959, and it basically would prepare. Uh, well, there was a couple of options. You could go toward the management side of food production, or you could go toward the engineering side. Uh -huh. And I chose the management side. So it was our technical courses were in things like packaging, um, canning. Uh, uh, freezing, dehydration, the various means of preserving foods, sure. and then of course you had to get them into the packaging. So that that was a, you know, that that was a very interesting um, course, and uh, and then taking in the business school, taking, uh, you know, courses in, right, in management, and yeah, labor relations, and all of these types of. And things. you graduated in sixty four. Nineteen sixty four. Okay. And you had been deferred from the draft because you had a student deferment. I had a student deferment, and I was, um, in fact, see, I graduated um, in 1964. I finished in March. I okay. had to go an extra quarter. I, uh -huh. I didn't have enough money to go back to school right. one quarter, so uh, I had to go the extra to finish. And um, I. I had talked to a uh, Coast Guard recruiter, uh -huh. um, and they assured me I had a slot, you know, for when I go back between 
uh, September, October, and March. Right. And, uh, and so I thought I'm all set up. So I just inventoried that. You know, my military obligation was going to be, you know, to the Coast Guard when I finished in in March of '64. And uh, and so I happened to finish, and I contact the recruiter, and he never heard of me. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's and, the nature and, of recruiters. And if, oh yeah, and, and and back at that time, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I understand that there were, uh, you know, some of those slots, particularly like the Coast Guard, were going to people more connected yeah. uh, politically than I sure. was. And, and the war really hadn't been winding no, up yet in '64, no. but you felt you had an obligation to serve, and so you joined. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and you know, there was, uh, you know, the options, it was really interesting because the options when I graduated from high school were go to college, you go in the service and, you know, get your, your military obligation out of the way. Right. Or you could get married, have a couple of children, and probably evade the military obligation. Right. And when my wife and I go through our, we graduated in the same year in winters in uh -huh. 1959 from high school. We go through our yearbook and almost every male in that class served. Wow. Okay. That's unusual. 1959. My sister was a year younger than I am, a year behind me in class, go through her yearbook and very few of those guys served. Huh. So something happened between 1959 and 1960 as far as the obligation attitude goes. Right. Drastic. Uh-huh. And uh, we've, so we scratch our head, you know, what happened? And we could spend the whole week talking about sure. the possibilities of what, what caused that particular, you it's know. Strange. Uh, but that know. happened. But that happened. You, you joined the Army. Yes. And a pilot program for officer candidate school, right? Yes. Um, I went to a recruiter uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, after, well, I called a draft board. Marion Bailey was running a bit draft board in Woodman for Yolo County. And I called her. She says, the best I can do, this was in March, she says, the best I can do, Jim, is I can keep you out till after the 4th of July. <laughs> and I go, well, that's very nice of you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And so I went and, and, and talked to a recruiter. And, you know, he kind of hummed and hawed and says, you know, he says, you're a college graduate. He says, the Army is putting together a pilot program uh, called the College Option Program. Which is what two years later I went through. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And so he said, you, um, you, you go in the Army and uh, you're, if you can pass the, you know, the mental and the physical requirements, you're guaranteed a spot at Officer Candidate School. Uh, and uh, if you complete the Officer Candidate School, if you complete the program, you will have a two-year obligation as, a, as an officer. Uh -huh. And at the end of that two-year obligation, then you're free to either pursue a career or get, leave the military. And so the total time served would be 34 months if you chose right. to get out. Be almost three years. Yeah, almost three years. Because we, you know, we had to go through uh, basic infantry training, basic advanced infantry, and which were like 16 weeks, right. four months. Yeah. And then we had 24 weeks, I think, or six months of officer candidate school. Right. And so you went to basic and AIT at Fort Gordon? At Fort Gordon, Georgia. Right. Yeah. Initially, I was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And the recruiter, I, I call a recruiter, of course. Now, you know, what am I going to need to take? Oh, you take a shaving kit. And uh, he says, when you get there, they're going to give you clothes. And, you know, and he says, you know, you better take some, you know, take some, you know, wear your shoes and stuff. Yeah. He says, you know, th they'll clothe you once you get there. Well, we were there a week. And they uh, had us doing all these chores, and this is June. Picking actually. up cigarette butts. Yep, June 4th of 1964, and the humidity is about 95, and the <laughs> temperature is about 90, yeah. and we're out there doing all this stuff. And I mean, w w we smelled like a you know a stable of camels after right. you know about two or three days, and <laughs> there were no, no clothes. We were well shaved, yeah. you know, but uh, uh, then they finally decided because they weren't sure whether they were going to keep us at Jackson. Oh, or Gordon. send us someplace else, and okay. then we ended up going to Gordon.
Yeah, I, I went to basic and AIT at Fort Jackson. At Jackson, and okay. I, I got there in April of 66, so okay. yeah, and uh, then I went from there to Benning, of course, like you probably did. Yes. Um, so, well, well, well see, it's pretty tough. Well, you know, um, Fort Gordon, the basic uh, course and the ad advanced infantry course was tough because we were the pioneers. Right. And they had a special cadre for us, and we went through as a group, uh -huh. and they smoked us. Uh, there were other uh, people in the platoons, but we were unique, pretty <laughs> much, you know, put together. Right. And uh, and we had uh, second lieutenants right out of OCS who were just smoking us <laughs> left yeah. and right. And e even when we get together, sometimes we say, you know, sometimes uh, we probably had a little harder. At, at then than we did at OCS at times. Yeah. You know, uh, for the oh, harassment. that's interesting. And, uh, yeah. And, the, uh, yeah, the, the, way, the way we were and treated. And the NCOs can beat on you when you're in basic and AIT oh. because you're not officers yet. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know? So this is the time to get after those college boys. Oh, you know? boy. And, yeah. and we were, that's what they called us, were you know, college boys. Yeah. Know? And that's, that's a real. But then on to OCS and, and um, that was uh, a very unique experience, as you're well aware. I think it was uh, one of the tougher things I ever did, yeah. you know. Just uh, <clears throat> when, when our group entered OCS, there were five OCS companies uh -huh. and for the infantry. Right. And they had an OCS for, uh, for artillery, which was at Fort Sill. Right. Which we affectionately referred to as the Comanche County Cannon Co Cockers College. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and then, and then I think armored at at at, uh, at Fort uh, Knox. Fort Knox, yeah. Yeah. So, but the infantry OCS were five companies, and uh, it was serious business, as you're well aware. We were spit shining floors. We spit shined, sh you know, our boots. Uh, the harassment was unreal. Yeah. Um, we the had senior candidates were waiting for us when we got oh. there. <laughs> oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. And, you know, we had these uh, inspections. Uh, our TAC officers were well-schooled in harassment. And we had cinder block walls that were painted kind of a, a cream color. And our mirror would be next to the, you know, right on the wall. And I'd come in and in grease pencil written on these cinder blocks would be, your mirror is dusty. And so that took care of my evening, <laughs> trying to get this, you know, the grease pencil off of the cinder block. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. or tack officers coming in and after you had spit shined your floor, digging their heel into your floor and, and spinning, you know, doing kind of, uh, you know, column right moves or column <laughs> left moves on your floor, or knocking your bunk over and ripping all the <laughs> bunk apart, taking everything out of your drawers, which of course was in so many inches, everything was different shape and just throwing everything on the floor. <laughs> this is, this looks like blankety blank and start <laughs> over, you know. I was uh, restricted to the battalion area for 17 weeks. Yeah. Other than, so my, uh, you know, I, I got to go to the cleaners. You right. know, and the first 17 yeah. weeks, as you're aware, we ran to the cleaners. You did ran no everywhere. Walking. <laughs> yeah, there was yeah. no walking. Yeah. And I could never figure out other than my, I was getting dinged every day for, you know, a lack of attention to detail. <laughs> and at the 17th week, I found out that in our uh, chest of drawers, we had a static display of underwear folded a certain way. Uh -huh. Our t-shirts were folded a certain way so that our name was in the center of the fold right. and so on. Well, there were, I think it was six t-shirts in the static display and the third t-shirt down stuck inside the label of the t-shirt was a little shaving from the grease pencil that he stuck in there. That was my lack of attention to detail. Kept me there 17 weeks. I mean, it wow. was absolutely yeah, <laughs> unbelievable. I, uh, we, we got a four hour on post pass to just the, the PX that was closest to us. Um, and I was the only one in my platoon who didn't get it. <laughs> and I, I told them I was I, I, I was the uh, unofficial platoon morale officer, and I was supposed to keep them smiling. And of course, you weren't allowed to smile or laugh or anything like that. Um, and so I paid for it. 
Yep, or eyeball. Yeah, no eyeball. eyeball. <laughs> yeah, I mean, meals to me were the, <laughs> the craziest thing. Yeah. You know, square meals, sitting at attention on the end of your chair, you know, having your fork and spoon at 90 degree angles to your plate and a uh, knife over a 45 degree angle with this <coughs> corner and then sitting there not eyeballing, looking straight ahead, <laughs> you know, chewing your food. And, and then the TAC officers would make stuff up just to make you miss meals to see how tough you were because I was never interested in food until I went into the Army and then I just couldn't eat enough, you know. I think it could have had something to do with the calories expended, but, <laughs> yeah. you know. Or the TAC officer might come up and lean over and put his face within about two inches of your nose and <laughs> say, candidate, I detest broccoli, <laughs> and, and you're supposed to keep a straight face. <laughs> right. Then you end up going out and doing your oh, push-ups. Yeah. And doing and laps around yeah. the building and then missing yeah. meals. So you get out of OCS, and what was next? Uh, I went to uh, uh, jump school. Actually, I went to ranger school, and then I got hurt. Oh. And uh, I had a, you know, a, a leg thing. It wasn't serious, but it was uh -huh. enough to keep me, you know, to keep me from moving on in, in, in ranger school. I needed, I needed a, a break for some healing, and I ended up at Martin Army Hospital. Oh, sure. For, for a while. One of my friends ended up there in jump school at Martin oh, Army uh, Hospital okay. and never finished jump school. So. And then after that, I was able to, to heal up, and I went to jump school. Did you jump out of C-119s? Uh, yes. Yeah, and, and, and flying and, box and, cars. And, and, and the flying box car and mentally would jump over that twin tail. I mean, to get the vigorous exit, Yeah. right, <laughs> <laughs> jump over the I tail. Know. Uh, I know. That was easy and, until they put, you know, they put like those big long ammo boxes on it and they put two sandbags in that and then you had your rifle strapped to your leg for the equipment jump. And everybody's steel pot would be banging on the <laughs> side of the plane because they just couldn't get away from it. You know, bomb, 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 <laughs> yeah. like this, you know. Yeah, and they had the real narrow door yeah. at, at the at the back. Yeah. And if you got a weak exit, you collide with a trooper. If you went out the same, you know, went out the same time, sure. and, and, do, and the jump know. masters would just, I mean, it scared the hell out of you because they say, you know, this is not a safe airplane, mm -hmm. and we may have to run you out the door if we're over 300 feet. And it's going to be close whether or not your chute's going to be open. And I'm thinking. Why are they running us out of aircraft that's not safe? You know, <laughs> this is bad enough just jumping out of airplanes, but give us a safe aircraft. And then they had uh, reserve Air Force pilots, uh -huh. and my first jump was a tree jump. Oh, jumped into the trees. Uh oh. And, um, and you know, as you're well aware, when you're standing in a door, and you're looking out the air, you know, looking, you know, looking out, you have no idea. It could be all all trees, and the drop zone could be couple sure. of seconds away, you right. know, but anyway, so I look out, it's all trees, and then green lighted, you know, and yeah. so, and I was a stick leader, okay. so, you know, out I go, and uh, you know, I, I start, you know, after I shoot deploys, and I start looking around, more trees, <laughs> I couldn't how, see. How high off the ground were you? Oh, th that jump was 1,100 feet. Yeah, I but think. I mean, when you landed in the tree, were you stuck oh, up? Oh, probably what, 40 feet, 50 feet? Oh boy. And went right through it and did everything they told us in training about tree jumps and yeah. power line, remember? The oh, power sure. line training yeah. and all the stuff. They yeah. train you for all of these eventualities and it, and it all worked because I did my rocking motion. Yeah. As it and you came down right. and hit the ground though? Yeah, I came down and hit the ground. And uh, later I found out that uh, the, uh, you know, they, they would run the pilot run and then they'd drop out a dummy yeah. and then figure wind or sure. do all of this stuff and when to green light. Yeah. And so uh, the, the instruction mm -hmm. came back to the cockpit of the plane to green light so many seconds from the from the water. Well, there was a lake and there was a river. <laughs> so <laughs> they green lighted <laughs> us oh boy. for the first yeah. one. And, uh, and it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was an experience, put it that yeah. way. We had this one, uh, in Special Forces, we had this one, the companies were run by lieutenant colonels. We had this one guy, Lancelot Kruger, who was really a hard ass. And I'm the drop zone safety officer, and I'm holding out a wind gauge, because we'd stand out there, and if it was more than 15 knots, we we're supposed to say, pull the panels and tell them not to jump. And so I started to pull the panels, and the colonel comes up and says, what are you doing? I says, well, sir, the wind's at 18 knots. He puts his thumb 
give me that gauge. He puts his thumb over the hole on the thing and says, there's no wind out here, jump him. And I'm going, <laughs> okay, it's on him though. It's not gonna be on yeah. me if anybody's hurt because the lateral speed was what oh. really hurt you. you know? Yeah, yeah, there was tree stumps every now and then. Yeah, and things are yeah. Quite, well, they, uh, well, they had that one jump with the 101st where they all those all those troopers got killed, yeah. you know, running into trees and stumps and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So. But uh, yeah, it was a, a great experience. <laughs> so after jump school, you go to jungle. after jump school, uh, I went to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, uh, Georgia. I went back to Fort Gordon. Okay. And they'd set up a special uh, uh, brigade over there to train Vietnam replacements. Oh, okay. And we would, it was a special nine-week AIT, and we would take uh, we would take these kids and run them through a pretty, pretty tough, you know, program. And the seventh or eighth week, they had to pass the uh, physical test for airborne. Uh -huh. And uh, so our mission was to get it, get them to Fort Benning to airborne school, and then right after airborne school, they were going to Vietnam as replacements. It, for the airborne units in Vietnam, okay. 173rd, the Cav at a unit, uh, 101st, and and so on, and so um, it was a, it was a good program. It was serious. I mean, when yeah. somebody went to sleep in the bleachers, we would remind them that uh, you know you don't want to miss anything. Uh, I remember the common sort of thing was. Uh, you know, in a lot of those lectures, look to the right of you, look to the left of you. You know, one of you is going to be killed in Vietnam. It's going to be the one who's sleeping or not paying attention. <laughs> exactly. And I used to say, it's going to be one of you guys. I'm not going to yeah. get killed. You know? Oh, uh, boy. So, <coughs> but it was a good program, and, and I can't go without uh, sharing a story uh, during, that, uh, during that time at Fort Gordon in this training unit. I went out there one Saturday, and every, every ninth week on Saturday morning, we'd get 250 new troopers. Uh -huh. And I went out there on one Saturday morning, and in the front row was a young man. His name was Danny Yates. And Danny was probably five foot five, five foot six, probably pushing 200 pounds. Ooh. And I walked up to him, and I looked him straight in the eye, and I gave him a direct order to lose 150 pounds by tomorrow morning. <laughs> and his eyes were about the size of pool balls. And, uh, and then I pulled him aside after the, that formation and told him, I don't want to see you eating a piece of bread. I don't want to see you eating a, any type of carbohydrate. And when everybody else is having a cigarette, I want you doing push-ups, and, you know, and I'm going to watch your plate you know, out in the field and in the mess hall. You know, and, yeah. and, and, and in other words, your time here is going to be absolutely miserable. And then he shared with me that he says, from as a child, he always wanted to be a paratrooper. Uh -huh. And he said his mother and his father and his older siblings and his friends says, you'll never be a paratrooper because you're fat. <laughs> so, and that was obvious. He didn't that see point. a lot of fat guys in the army. No, no. no. Especially after basic training, sure. you know, and uh, so anyway, uh, you know, you had to be able to do six pull-ups. Yeah, he couldn't do one. All right, and so eighth week or whatever it was when we did the the airborne training, it was again it was on a Saturday, and I was over there going around, and they were doing the mile run and doing all those different things for the for the uh, airborne. Uh -huh. physical test, and I, I heard uh, Yates, you know, come up over the loudspeaker, and and they were, uh, and I look, and there was this uh, this black soldier, probably six one, 185 pounds, built like a brick shit house, and he pull, he had on a, one of Yates's fatigue shirts, <laughs> and he. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he commences to to do the event. I think it was a mile run, uh -huh. and so I, I went over and I jumped on my little red Volkswagen and I drove back to the company area. I went into the barracks, and uh, Yates was in there reading a funny book or something, <laughs> and uh, I went over and I told him to get his, you know get his butt out of that bed, <laughs> and uh, I said, "What's going on?" He says, "How much did it cost you to?" You know, to have uh, uh -huh. that trooper take your place at the physical thing. Okay. He says, "Well, sir," he says. He says, "I paid him twenty-five dollars." I said, "Okay." 
I said, I'm gonna, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send you to Benny. I says, I'm really a nice guy compared to what you're going to go through <laughs> down there trying yeah. to get through that airborne program. And do you know and if he ever made it? That's part of the story. Um, I sent him to Benning along with the others. And about a month later, three weeks to a month, uh, again, I think it was on a Saturday, there's a knock on the orderly room door. And, you know, come on in. My first sergeant used different language about troops entering the orderly sure. room. Right. And, uh, and it was Yates. And he came in and he was wearing airborne wings. Yeah, there you go. And he, he came from, from Fort Benning back to Fort Gordon to thank me. That's nice. And it brought tears to my eyes. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, yeah. He's so proud. And then I ran into him in Vietnam, too. Right. Uh, and speaking later. of Vietnam, let's get there. You go over well, in I, May yeah. of 66. Yeah, and I, uh, after Fort Gordon, in between Fort Gordon and Vietnam, I was down in Panama. Jungle Warfare to School. To the Jungle Warfare School down there, school, the famous School of Americas. Right. And uh, that, w that was quite an experience. It was uh, a wonderful experience, primarily because I was acclimated yeah. you know, in, a, in a tropical in uh, a environment. Probably rained every day and it was hot. Yes, uh, hot and it was, in fact, it was April. <coughs> and so it was a rainy season. Yeah. And uh, they gave us these little, uh, life preserver that you slip over your head and you uh -huh. you'd blow on right. to fill up to cross streams. I heard people drown down there oh, right? you in could. the training. And and so you know you, and uh, we were roughly we were on the Chagres and the Rio Indios, the rivers. Uh -huh. And the Rio Indios is where they filmed oh, Humphrey Bogart and somebody oh, sure, Jungle yeah. Queen or, or uh, African, African Queen. African Queen was yeah. filmed was filmed there. Sure. So it was a <coughs> rather intense jungle uh, yeah. down there and uh, you know you'd look in a stream and you'd see tropical fish mm. and then finally you'd clear your head and say this is where they live yeah i mean it was just such a or look up wow. in the tree and see these beautiful tropical birds yeah uh but uh, anyway the uh y you would be walking along and all of a sudden there's this torrid stream going across you know the trail that you'd be walking on so you'd <laughs> Blow up your little uh, life, <laughs> little life jacket. Yeah. Walk out and barely get over the your boot. <laughs> I mean, it would be about <laughs> this you never deep. Knew, right? You couldn't take a chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that could have been. And something that was two inches deep might be a few hours later might be Ex over your head. Exactly, because they were narrow. Yes, all these streams yeah. are narrow. Yeah, um, but that was a that was a good school. Yeah, a well, you're, school. you're getting going through all kinds of good training. Yeah, I got a little yeah. bit of ranger training, jung jungle warfare, and jump yeah. school and. And then, uh, yeah, then I, uh, I went directly from uh, from Fort Sherman uh, up to, well, uh, yeah, I think I got home for like a weekend and then uh -huh. uh, went to Travis and took a plane to Vietnam. Yeah, Tan Sinh Nhut. Tan Sinh Nhut. Yeah. And uh, I think stayed overnight at Tan Sinh Nhut. And, uh, and the 101st was located where then? Or your well, brigade was? It, it, the, the brigade was headquartered at uh, Phan Rang, okay. which was an air, there was an air base, substantial air base near uh, Cameron Bay. Okay. Very close to Cameron Bay. Okay. And uh, I saw the base camp the day I got there and the day, no, the day I got there. <laughs> and I never saw it again. <laughs> and we didn't. Uh, that's pretty typical. Yeah. We were never there. And we, uh, there were, the 101st had, it was the 1st Brigade, had three battalions. Uh -huh. The first of the 327, the second of the 327, and the second of the 50 Deuce. Okay. That was the three rifle battalions <laughs> that made up the 101st 1st Brigade. The second of the 327 stayed over in the uh, on the coast, uh -huh. and, and generally between uh, um, what uh, uh, Tuiwa and the, the, the coastal town north of that's Tuiwa. probably a little better duty than what the well, other battalions yeah, it, got. Well, yeah, and they 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 got into you know they got into some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah they did. But we, the, us, and the Odus worked together, and we were Westmoreland's reaction force. Oh, okay. So whenever an A camp, which you're very familiar with, yeah. would get probed two or three nights in a row, right, we would go in and radiate patrols out of the A camp. Okay. 
And if we stepped in doo-doo, they would pull us out, because we were only 10, 12 guys. Yeah. And they pull us out and put in the calf. Oh. Rain the calf on them. Okay. And then we'd move on to the yeah. next crises. Sure. And so we moved a lot. And we were the most mobile battalions in Vietnam. Okay. 17 C-130s would move us lock, stock, and barrel. Did you stay in one corps, or could you go to any we, corps? We were mostly uh, two and three corps. Okay. So uh, that'd be the Central Highlands and then the sort of Iron Triangle, you know, area yeah. then. Yeah. A lot of time in uh, two corps. Okay. Uh, both uh, like Kontum Province yeah. and also the Tuiwa area over yeah. on the coast. And Dok To. And Dok To is in Kontum. Yeah. Yeah, those yeah. are hairy areas. Um, so you were, a, you were a platoon leader. Platoon then. leader, yeah. yes. And we were primarily just set up as, you know, we, we, we did, all we did was patrol, daytime patrols and nighttime ambushes. I right. Mean, so we were very busy. Yeah. And um, under strength, I mean, it was, but well, we were just light. Like everybody. Yeah. 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 And like I say, a platoon, I don't think my platoon's, my platoon strength ever went over 16. Jeez. And it's supposed to be 30. 42. 42, yeah. 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 That's and most of them I heard later were maybe low 30s, but at 16, you guys were yeah, half that. We, we were pretty light. Yeah. But it had its advantages, you know, on the type of work we were doing. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of navigating and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it was... Um, it was very interesting. I became very comfortable in the jungle. Uh -huh. And like I say, I, I can't imagine fighting in like the current situations where, uh, how could I navigate? Sure. <laughs> I, mean, I navigated yeah. by footsteps. I mean, as you're well aware, yeah. I mean, carried a shoestring every 100 uh -huh. meters. I, uh, if it was reasonably flat, 132 steps was 100 meters. Uh -huh. Tie a knot in a shoestring. And, you know, run an azimuth on the compass. Yeah. And, uh, you know, run off a map and from reference points <laughs> on the map, everything is pretty. Becomes critical knowing where you are. If you got to call yeah. in artillery or air or whatever, you don't want to call in oh. it on yourself. Yeah, so. I, I was very comfortable that I knew where I was within five meters. That's great. I mean, and and, and so when you go on a patrol, you'd set up a, you know, a, a, an aisle so to speak, uh -huh. and you know, and have. 50 meters on each side, walk sure. down the middle, and each and every 100 meters have a checkpoint, and call it, you have one tube, uh -huh. one artillery tube, you know, marking it, so from checkpoint one, then the tube would move to checkpoint two, and go through two, and then right. move to three, so right. if we ever ran into trouble, pretty quick reaction to have. And you'd set up ambushes, did you get ambushed? Yes, <laughs> a couple <laughs> of times, but yeah. I'm here to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and towards the end of your tour, you you get malaria. Well, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, toward the end of my tour, I had to get my R and R in. Oh. And I chose Bangkok, uh -huh. Thailand. So um, went out of the field, uh, flew out of the train uh, to uh, to Bangkok, uh -huh. and. Uh, the night I got there to Bangkok, I was kind of chilly and it's 95 degrees all the time in Bangkok. You know, <laughs> I'm freezing yeah. and you know, hot uh -oh. and cold and stuff like that. So uh -oh. they had an army hospital that was a motel or hotel, Western style, in Bangkok, and I, I went and they checked me in there and and. Uh, they knew I was sick, and they were running blood tests, but nothing, you know. So it was horrible, absolutely horrible. And I was there for 30 days in that. And um, just toward the end of the 30 days, um, one of the, I had a lieutenant colonel, uh, was uh, my doctor, and he, and he put me on quinine. Uh -huh. There was no malaria showing up in a blood test, but he put me on quinine. My, my fever stopped. Huh. And as long as you didn't have any fever, you could go outside. So I thought it was a good time to go down and see Bangkok downtown. And so I went out. Uh, I'd been free of the fever for maybe three or four days. And I went out and kind of saw the sights a little bit. And I'm coming back. 
and I had to run across this boulevard. Uh, you know, there's no respect for uh, pedestrians right. in that part exactly. of the world. <laughs> and so exactly. I had to run across this uh, this boulevard, and I run just about to the other side, and I fall down. I just like that, and then I got up, and I'm just. And it wasn't from being scared; it was yeah fever. So. I, I walked back. I was only a couple blocks from the hospital. Walked back and went in, and they ran a blood test. And now it's and shows. then they they came down and got me. and said, "You you got to come up here and see this." Yeah. And they showed me the through the microscope, and it was just crawling. And they said that's falciparum malaria. And I'm wow. going, "Yeah, at least you know what I have." Yeah. And so then they moved me. Uh, well, actually. They were going to send me to the Philippines and got there, it was full, so they moved me up to Okinawa. And I spent, um, I, I don't remember, 60, 90 days yeah. in the hospital in Okinawa, wow. reco recover Sorry. recovering and, and whatnot. And then um, they'd lost all my records. Uh oh. They lost my medical records, they lost my financial records. And I'm getting letters from my CO in, in, in Vietnam, and he said, <laughs> He said, he, he says, they've got you AWOL. <laughs> the, the, the unit had me AWOL for not coming back from sure. R&R. From, from, uh, from and he says, I know where you are. He said, <laughs> <laughs> he says, we got a problem. You know, the Army runs on paperwork. Oh, yeah. And so finally, uh, you know, because I wanted to, I'd put in my papers for indefinite and in an RA commission. And, you know, I was, you know, I, was re I, I loved the Army. I loved it. And even in that business, it was it was great. And uh, so I just finally fed up, and I went to uh, went down to uh, uh, Kadena Air Force Base uh -huh. there, there in Okinawa. And I said, "Send me home." They said, "On what authority?" I said, "Just send me home." I says, "I'm you know I says I don't have any papers and stuff like that." And I'm talking to like an E6, and he said, "Well, there's nothing we can do." I says. I says, who runs this shop? And he says, well, it's a 05. I said, well, I want to talk to Lieutenant Colonel Lynn. And I went and told him, I said, hey, I'm just, I'm up to here. I said, send me home. I says, I got no papers and blah, blah, blah. So he did a little bit of checking and I gave him some references in Vietnam. And right. He had me a flight to Travis and uh, within a day. Wow. And then didn't you I got get out, out of service I got at that out. time? Yeah. yeah. And was, just, uh, just to sort of summarize, I know we probably ran over a little bit here, but after you got out, you worked in the industry that you were trained for. Yes, well, after I got out, I uh, got home Easter Sunday of um, 1967, and then I, um, I started sending out resumes and making phone calls, uh -huh. and started lining up interviews, and then I ended up with uh, with Libby, yeah. and uh, at which time their their Western uh, region was headquartered in San Mateo, and they put me in the in the cannery in, uh -huh. in Sunnyvale, and right. that was a great experience. Worked with some great people, and then they they moved me up to San Mateo, and I worked in their regional office for a while, and then they sent me to Chicago, which was where their headquarters was. And I was newly married, and. Uh, they sent me there before Christmas, just me, and, <laughs> and then right after, like, 1st of January, loaded a moving van and, you know, we moved to Chicago. And uh, I lasted about eight months there. Because the guy that, I went to Chicago because the head of the Western region said, I want you to go back there and get that corporate exposure and, and la, 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 and he says, you know, come back here and you'll have a good responsible job here in the region. That worked for me. Yeah. Well, I'm in Chicago, and about July, uh, Jack Cox, <laughs> this guy shows up, and he'd been <laughs> promoted to Chicago. So my ticket oh. back home was gone. Yeah. And, you know, my wife, and you know, my, they, we didn't, you know, didn't want to stay in, in Chicago for the rest of our lives. So I don't blame you. Uh, I uh, contacted a headhunter. And rather quickly ended up with Dole yeah. and they I, I came out and interviewed with them for a job in San Jose at that time Dole's uh, uh, their production was all headquartered in Honolulu uh -huh. and all the marketing and, and and services and stuff were in San Jose 
Okay. So I went to work <coughs> in San Jose uh, as a, uh, I guess it was kind of like, it was a, 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 a coordination job where I was between marketing and production, uh -huh. and, you know, working, uh, you know, putting everything together. You know, you, you'd take a, you'd take the crops and you could convert those into, you know, cans. Right. And then see if marketing can sell them and marketing said, we can't sell that much or we could use more. Worked that out with, <coughs> with uh, the production people. And it was real exciting and learned the, that business pretty well and and I was really really enjoying what I was doing just immensely uh, even I got moved from San Jose to San Francisco they moved uh, all the food food divisions into San Francisco and, um, and then they moved they offered me and wanted me to go into sales and so I went moved over into the the the, uh, the sales and I became their uh, um, food service uh, sales manager for the East Coast from Miami to Boston although my office was in San Jose oh, gee. so I had a lot of, a lot of travel yeah you know. I'll bet and that was a great experience and really enjoying it and kind of learning it and stuff and then they come and say you know we have an opportunity for uh, to go back to San Francisco and I said well what would happen if I I you know decline that opportunity and they said well you'll be okay I said okay I respectfully decline this opportunity and it wasn't a few months later they came back and said we have this opportunity in Ventura uh, the company has bought a mushroom company a family mushroom company that's mushroom country and so I'm going you know and and we'd like you to go down to Ventura and you'll be the first corporate employee to go into this family run company and that'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> so I said, what happens if I decline? And they said, you're not, not a good idea. Yeah. You know, if you like the company, you better, you better take this one. And yeah. so anyway, I ended up going down there and ended up about six years in the mushroom business. Okay. And uh, then they moved me from Ventura to uh, New England and put together a, an operation in New England. And, you were all over the place. Yeah, and that, and that was a that was a, a rather it was a great experience, you know, buying the real estate and working with the engineers, building the farm, and all this other stuff. Sure. But they, uh, they originally it was going to be a three million pound farm, and we were going to bring it up to three million pounds over a full year. And then I get a call as a project, just as the project's getting underway, and they said we were going to make it a 10 million pound farm. Wow. And I'm saying it's not going to work. It isn't going to work because I was working very closely with the New York marketing people, and they knew what the size of the market was and everything. Uh -huh. And uh, got overruled, and we built this 10 million pound farm, and of course it failed miserably. And they should have listened to you. <laughs> well, they <laughs> should have listened to a lot of people, but you know, like I said, uh, they when they came to me, they said it was the Harvard Whiz Kids. Sure. Economy of scale was their current buzzword, well, and uh, it was an uh, interesting experience. So. Well, Jim, uh, I kind of like to just sum up, and sort of my last question to you is, what do you think about your time in the army? I mean, what what sort of memories do you have? I mean, how do you feel about that? You told me that you're. Officer candidate class has met every year since 1994, and I think that's that's terrific. Um, but well, yes, it's a it's a real special group of guys. Um, just um, um, tremendous group of people, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've I've often said that uh, the the time in the army is the the peer group was second to none. You know, I'm, I've been around in the business world and worked for, you know, a number of companies and stuff, but sure. never a peer group uh, like uh, like these guys. And, yeah. Um, uh, it's just tremendous. I have to admit, I feel the, the same way about my OCS group. I mean, I over the years, I've written 56 newsletters to them, you know, to just kind of summarize what's going on with everybody, and we honor those guys who pass on. and honored those who were killed in Vietnam, and uh, I, I love those guys. They're really special to me. Yeah, we had one, uh, 
one classmate who was a, a very unique individual, uh, well, among several unique people, but uh, Rick was uh, very unique in that he was a Brit uh -huh. and had, had been in Africa okay. uh, as a mercenary. Uh, yeah. And uh, they ended up, uh, he, <laughs> he was incredible when they, when they ran out of, you know, killing communists in Africa. Uh, there was another guy who was a class ahead of us, uh -huh. uh, Dan Hill, who talked Rick into coming. Dan was with the CIA in Africa, okay. and he was just over there observing. Uh -huh. But he was real impressed with uh, with Rick, and he said, "You know, he says you want to continue to kill communists, he says, you're going to have to come up, come to the U.S. because <laughs> we're getting a little something going in Vietnam." Uh -huh. And so uh, Rick came to Vietnam, and he ended up in our OCS class, and uh, his pictures on the it's on the cover of We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Oh, sure. Uh, that's him yeah. on, the, on the cover, and they've got a statue at Fort Benning now out in f uh, of him. I haven't seen it yet. But first we'll first Cav there. General Moore. Yeah, yeah, yeah Colonel a Hal Moore. Hell book. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so Rick was there, and then uh, sadly, uh, Rick was uh, killed in the World Trade Center on oh, uh, no. September 11th. Oh, wow. And um, quite a story. Yeah. Well, Jim, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming all the way down from Oregon to do this interview. Uh, I'd like to thank you for well, your I, service. Well, thank you, and, and you also, Bob, and you know, I, I, I really enjoyed it. And that's great. Good to see you. Well, nice meeting you and yeah. just meeting you in person instead of just talking to you yeah, on the phone. Yeah, talking on the phone. And we, yeah. I, uh, uh, you know, we have a common friend in John Lindemann. Yes, and, uh, good man. Yep. Um, well, this concludes our time on Valley to Vietnam. I'd like to thank Jim for his service and for, as I mentioned, coming down from Oregon and say welcome to him and all the veterans out there. For Valley to Vietnam producer Jerry Ward and director James Scott, I'm Bob Tribe, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.